physical education generally has always certainly been a giant. John is a partner at Blake Castles. He served overseas in the Army from 1943 to 46. Certainly when uh, uh, I was going to law school here in the 50s, he was the instructor in death duties, and if I was appalled as I was at the omission of the Federal Estate Tax Act from the program, it's his fault because he drilled it into our heads how important it was. And um, John was the man who established the wills and trusts section of the Canadian Bar Ontario section about 16 years ago. He went on then to be president of the Ontario branch of the Canadian Bar in 1971. He uh, developed and administered Tax One, which is the well-known program of the Canadian Bar. And finally, and I think most important, he was the really, I think, the person behind the uh, very well received annual institute and continuing legal education that the Canadian Bar in Ontario puts on every year, a three-day program which uh, is extremely well attended and an extremely helpful program to the profession. Um, John Hodson is going to speak on the important topic of uh, conflict of interests among trustees obviously a topic that was of no concern to any of the prior speakers in the program. John? I, I think, Burke, <clears throat> since I'm the last speaker, I might be allowed to uh, express undoubtedly the view of all of us that we uh, welcomed your ingenuity and uh, expression and uh, we're delighted to have you lead us by the hand to this rostrum. Um, you, you, you'll, you'll not find in your, in your material uh, an outline on what I'm about to say. Uh, I, had, uh, I was asked for it, and I had some uh, hesitation in submitting it. What I propose to do is to uh, read you the outline, however, and uh, let you judge for yourself uh, whether I was justified in my hesitation. Uh, <clears throat> the law as to <clears throat> conflicts of interest and duty is unclear. Once you go beyond the area of a trustee making a financial profit, the statement of the law is unworkable. A new definition is essential. I see one now on the horizon. You aren't going to like it much either. Well, in the past two and a half days, uh, you've been hearing some very erudite people uh, expound on the law, uh, and you might care to put that into, uh, into capitals for emphasis. Uh, this is the anticlimax. because it's taking a, a look at an area where the law doesn't really exist other than a statement in such general terms that the uh, scholars can argue over the implications for 100 years and scarcely even repeat themselves. Unfortunately for us, you and I equally, uh, I've tried to conceal this in the uh, article itself by making the footnotes as long as possible. Uh, but uh, I should also caution you that uh, what I say now has uh, very little re relationship to what I've written. And the whole area of conflict of interest and duty, it was well, certainly one which a trust practitioner uh, develops a sensitivity to. It's, uh, well, it's a throb in the tooth or a twitch of a muscle anyway. Uh, but we're dealing at, at it with the at, at it in the uncertainty level. The, uh, does the throb call for a dentist? Uh, does the twitch call for a neurologist? Or is it simply uh, an unpleasant manifestation of the flesh? Uh, or equity, as the case may be. <clears throat> and let's get on with the urgent business of the day. 
And in dealing with the conflict of interest and duty, I'm not thinking of a trustee who, uh, under whatever circumstances, happens to make a profit on the side. And the question is whether the trust beneficiaries can make them account for it. I'm exploring the area of conflict into which a trustee <coughs> is thrust primarily <coughs> because he's trying to be a good trustee. Uh, and I'm using as a model that of the trustee whose trust investments include some shares of a limited company. And to protect the trust investment, he becomes a director of the company. So on the one hand, he's a fiduciary of the trust shares for the beneficiaries of the trust. And on the other hand, he's a fiduciary of all the shareholders of the for the company's welfare. And I'm not making the very startling assumption that what is good for the estate is not necessarily good for the company. It has some aspects of bigamy. The story the other day was, what, two mother-in-laws? <clears throat> you can even try it out as trigamy, as a matter of fact. Uh, put a conscientious trust company as trustee of an estate the estate original assets include a block of shares of the conscientious trust company. The trust company votes its own shares to elect its own directors, <coughs> who are then trustees of the estate. <coughs> so it's a, a role of strong similarities to that of a director of two companies whose business fares cross. And it may well be that the problems faced by interlocking boards uh, will be the problems that get into court before uh, these direct trustee relationships get in. And it may well be that uh, what is said there will be of, inf of interest and influence. But in our case, we have the direct trustee relationship, <clears throat> unequivocal. Now, let me do a little more skirting around the problem. Uh, our, our Canadian Trustees Bible by Donovan Waters has a great deal to say about the underlying duties of a trustee, and he deals with them under the three headings. And we're only interested in the one. Uh, he deals with delegation of trust, standard of care, and uh, the one we're interested in, conflict of interest and duty. He describes them as fundamental duties arising out of the essence of the relationship of trustee and beneficiary, and he includes this quote. In other words, the first duty of this trustee, as of all trustees, was to follow implicitly the terms of the trust instrument, and secondly, to observe those general principles of trust law which do not run counter to the expressed terms of the trust. <clears throat> I've yet to see, even in the acres of Fullscap, we have the tendency to uh, adopt as trusty powers. Mm. Anything that says uh, the equivalent of, quote, my trustee may indulge in any conflict of interest he considers advisable. <laughs> in other words, we're talking about a problem which is unlikely to go away just because of good will drafting. And in another passage, Donovan Waters has summarized the trustee duties as, uh, first, <clears throat> no trustee may delegate his office to others. Secondly, no trustee may profit personally from his dealings with the trust property, with the beneficiaries, or as a trustee. Thirdly, no, the trustee must act honestly with that level of skill and prudence which would be expected of the reasonable man of business administering his own affairs. <clears throat> You'll notice that uh, uh, what was earlier referred to as conflict of interest and duty has been transmuted into no trustee may profit personally from his dealings with the trust property or with the beneficiaries or as a trustee. And he's absolutely right. But we're now taking it the step further in our inquiry. And the trustee is not making a profit, and we are left with 
what does the conflict of interest and duty definition mean? Uh, you'll be glad to know Waters uh, has not ignored the problem, uh, but he has managed to compress them into a few footnotes. And some concluding paragraphs in the cha chapter in which he anticipates that legislation appropriate to the position of different fiduciaries will ultimately be proposed. Now, I'm unaware of anyone who's made a serious attempt to set out the rule for the purposes of legislation. Uh, I must admit it's a lack of inquiry rather than a lack of research, than, rather than based on research. But I personally have the uneasy feeling that any draftsman would arrive at the same conclusion as the English commissioners did who set out to draft a simple definition of charity. Uh, there's no such animal, and we're better off to leave it to the courts. And I suspect the problem will be left to the courts. Now, with that introduction, <laughs> let me also introduce you to a classic definition of the trustee's duty. It was given by Lord Herschel in the House of Lords in 1896. It is an inflexible rule of a court of equity that a person in a fiduciary position is not, unless otherwise expressly provided, entitled to make a profit. He is not allowed to put himself in a position where his interest <coughs> and duty conflict. This is the case of Brain Ford, and it's uh, a classic definition, but it's also a classic example of how English <coughs> uh, equity is developed. It was, a, uh, it was an action for libel. Now, referring to this in a commentary in the Alberta Law Review, Professor McLean attempts to resolve uh, whether the prohibition uh, is against making, against making a profit was part of the prohibition against the trustee putting himself in a position where his interest and duty conflict, uh, whether they are two separate and distinct rules, whether they overlap. Uh, and that's really our fundamental mental question today. <clears throat> McLean takes 20 close-knit pages to carry the definition through its subsequent history in the courts of England and Canada. Obviously, he doesn't solve the problem or I wouldn't be speaking today. He does provide a little cold comfort, however, and, and I'd like to read his concluding words. Or, or <clears throat> It is perhaps better argument to say that a trustee ought not to conduct himself as to impose such a burden on his beneficiary, that is the conflict of interest and duty. The prudent and careful trustee where he sees the possibility of a conflict ought to consult his beneficiaries in advance, and get their informed, independently advised consent. Alternatively, he may secure court approval for his proposed actions. But this is not, certainly not encouraging to a trustee who is facing problems on a daily basis, including uh, what kind of dividend should he as director vote for, how and where will the company get operating, operating funds, or should the business branch out and extend its operations. Well, I began by saying that I was not concerned with the aspect of the trustee making a profit. That's true. But I found to my dismay that virtually everything that has been said in the courts relating to conflict of interest and duty in this aspect is in relation to a trustee profiting from his trust. And so willy-nilly, uh, I've been forced to use the same approach merely to decide uh, what Lord Herschel's definition means. I'll spare you the details, uh, which you'll be most welcome to read. In summary, uh, as I see it, the English cases, which were driven to for lack of Canadian, uh, do not go so far as to prohibit the trustee director profiting from his directorship. There are certainly instances in which he may retain the director's fee particularly where the compensation he receives as director of the company 
can be attributed to some real degree as incidental to the work he performs as such, and not solely attributable to his control of the company's shares. Now, I think that puts a definite limitation on Lord Herschel's primary prohibition against profit. And I'm encouraged to take the next step and uh, uh, <clears throat> argue for the proposition that the, the trustee is indeed permitted to put himself in a position where his interest and duty may potentially or actually conflict and assume the role of director. So, looking around you, uh, there are such a substantial number of trustees who are already actively performing the consequential role of director that uh, this can hardly be considered a brilliant exercise in logic. There's also uh, not merely encouragement, but an exhortation in an English case, relucking's will trust. The trustee is likely to be considered as failing in his duties if he's content to depend on the information available to him as a shareholder, as contrasted to that available as a director. Then having placed him in that role of a director, what's the advice we should give him in carrying out the role? Well, many of the American cases, and they're cited by Wolf Goodman in an article uh, <clears throat> in 76, I believe, following on an article by uh, Ralph Skeen, um, they come, give me the rather horrifying implication that the trustee must act as if he were exclusively a trustee. He must attempt to carry through into the corporation all the precepts of the trustee, regardless of the conflicting interests of the other shareholders, and even the best interests of the corporation. Now, if this should prove to be the development, I fear that uh, we have rocky roads ahead for trustees. But I'm also encouraged uh, to feel that this will not be the answer. Having wiped out poor Lord Herschel in theory and practice my own mind as an inadequate, I do hope we can hope for <clears throat> a level of sophistication in the courts here uh, that will recognize the year 1980 rather than 1896. And I believe that we are likely to get a turn uh, in the approach, uh, I find it in uh, Lask and Jay's judgment of Canadian Arrow versus O'Malley in 1974. And in that, he speaks of the avoidance, uh, not of a conflict of interest, but a conflict of self-interest in the rule. And he, the rule itself, he states as, in its generality betokens loyalty, good faith, and avoidance of a conflict of duty and self-interest. I think it's a whole new ball game. And it leaves a great deal unanswered. A loyalty to whom? Uh, the trust or the corporation. Good faith to whom? The trust or the corporation. And then, but having allowed the trustee to assume the two disparate roles, I think it must also be allowed that it's loyalty and good faith to both. In other words, if we abandon the negative approach of Lord Herschel, and we do indeed adopt the position, which for lack of a better end we might call Alaskan, we make it possible for the trustee to function in the two roles, but we certainly should not anticipate that his role will be simple. Uh, for today's purposes, uh, the best I can do for you is to put forward some general propositions. And the first is negative, uh, that we should emulate the California lawyers from that great testing ground of professional malpractice suits and <clears throat> learn to practice defense of law and be sure that the trustee is, we are advising, practices it as well. He, he's, he's got to recognize and act in a way indicative of his recognition of those separate responsibilities. Somehow he must maintain separate records of how he did it. 
recognizing he's at risk not merely to his beneficiaries, but to the other shareholders. Now, the second general proposition is also negative. We should ensure to the extent we are able that the trustee is exposed to continuing legal advice. This sounds a little absurd, perhaps, in this company. After all, we are ready and willing at all times. Unfortunately, uh, so ready and willing, we may not only be the solicitor, uh, we may also find ourselves as the trustee director. This triple role, I'd like to suggest, is uh, beyond the capacity of even the most dexterous of us. And uh, a person who proposes to ride three horses needs three legs. The third general proposition uh, is at least positive, even though thoroughly indefinite. We're, we're living in an area in which, an era in which the possibility of litigation relating to conflicts of interest and duty that face a trustee, it's not, it is being enlarged not merely by the substantial involvement in the corporate holdings of a vast number of trusts, it's being enlarged through the increasing sensitivity of the trust beneficiary to his equitable claims on the loyalty and good faith of the trustee. So it's coming from both sides. Some of the continuous process of reporting to the beneficiaries on what is being proposed and carried out on their behalf in the name of the trustee will certainly never equal the protection afforded by a court ruling that McLean recommended. But it's a great deal easier to achieve. It will go a very long way indeed to ensure it. And this requires some rethinking and enlargement of what is now the universal custom of half yearly or yearly financial statements sent to beneficiaries. Most of these seem designed for the benefit of the computer programmer rather than the edification of the beneficiary. It, I contemplate a periodic or at least spasmodic commentary on the State of the Union. Even as we may have to depend upon cases dealing with the role of directors of companies as fiduciaries to develop the laws to trustees, we may also be well advised to consider the standards of reporting required by directors to their shareholders as giving us useful guidance for trustees. And if, as I believe, we are moving away from the absolute prohibitions of equity's first early steps towards the acceptance of principles of justification. And not everyone's going to think that's an improvement, including, as I, have, I must say, honestly and somewhat deflatingly, those very learned professors Donovan Waters and McLean. What we're really doing is we're exchanging the guillotine, you know, guilty off with his head. But if your head doesn't come off, at least you know you're safe. For some Chinese form of thought control, what are his intentions as a continuing process, inquire, probe? We may well be exchanging our familiar form of passing accounts uh, with all the errors of judgment of the trustee concealed by virtually uninterpretable symbols and figures, and turning to some form of dialogue and examination of discovery instead. So I don't say that it'll be easier to live with. I just say that I think we must learn to live with it, because that's where I believe the development of the equitable rules against conflicts of interest and duty are taking us. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, and uh, this concludes the 30th annual special lectures. On your behalf, I would like to thank all of our very excellent speakers. <laughs>